Hello and welcome everyone. This is our second gallery talk. So I'm Nathalie Ferrier, I'm the gallery director at the Cape Cod Community College. And our guest today is Michael McMahon. Michael is a painter and he was born in Ireland in 1981. He lives in Falmouth. He received his master's degree at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Michael was a Cape Cod Community College student in 2000 and he graduated in 2003. He teaches painting at Tufts University. He has been the recipient of numerous grants and awards, including the Dana Pond Award for painting. So in 2018, I led you at the college and you showed the Black Mirror series. So I'm thinking of that painting that is called TARP, T-A-R-P. Uh, it's very, very large. It's uh, 96 inches by 72 inches. So may maybe you can show it to us, Michael. And uh, let me know if uh, this is working. Top, yeah, it's filled with water and we can see the clouds reflecting in the water. So, um, and somebody I think is holding a teacup, right? Yes. So I'm, I'm going to let you uh, tell us more about uh, this painting and about the, the meaning of a teacup in, in your paintings. Okay, so um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, this was the body of work I showed at the Higgins Gallery at Cape Cod Community College in 2018. And um, this body of work was something I started in graduate school and this continued to make for quite a while. And um, I call it the Black Mirror series, which is um, it's also the name of a popular television show. But um, initially my idea was um, a Black Mirror is a painting tool that was used by landscape painters. Um, was used um, quite frequently by members of the Hudson River School. And what it is, is they would um, create these black polished surfaces. And what that would allow you to do is when you were trying to figure out the uh, values in the landscape to apply those to the paintings. And then for the non-painters and non-artists here, the uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about value is all of the appropriate lights and darks that were going to show up in the landscape paintings. So what they would do, and it was very, very similar to what we have now, when you look at your phone, when the screen's turned off, you're just looking at that black glassy screen, you're getting a dark reflection. And what happens is you start to, so they would turn around and stare at these black reflective surfaces, and just really reduce the landscape to just its lights and darks. And a lot of my work is really concerned with um, our engagement with the landscape and the places that we live. And then, um, and then I can quickly go through this whole body of work. Um, so um, a lot of this too was engaged with just um, ideas of figures who had this um, kind of like air of authority around them, you know, standing in kind of like important positions and uh, dressed in suits. Um, but at the same time, you'll see that like a lot of the paintings come across as like a little ridiculous and uh, you're not really quite sure what the people are doing in there even though it has an air of importance. And they're also a little dislocated from their, um, their tasks. And then if I can zoom in right here, you can see this figure right here is uh, holding a teacup. And in every one of these paintings, um, somebody is holding a teacup, which I'll explain a little later on as we uh, move through these paintings. Um, so um, here you're seeing a group of figures um, 
the horizon way off in the distance on a reflective surface. Jane intended to be ice. And you can see this long cable moving through the painting, kind of like helping like activate some of those uh, cooler, more vibrant colors that were uh, showing up in that reflective ice. Um, you know, trying to tune in a uh, old rabbit ear television. Um, you can also see the teacup here. Um, and I was just really interested in this idea with this painting of, you know, trying to engage with the world with, um, you know, out of date technologies and out of date modes of interpreting and engaging with the world. And then here we can actually see um, two figures drilling holes in the ice and uh, placing like these small little packages into these little holes they're carving. And you can see as you move around the painting, the holes are forming kind of a circle. And also you can see that the landscape itself has been like tipped up in a way where we're now engaging with a landscape where there's no horizon line, but it is also a little bit removed in a way from the actions of the figures. You'll notice that throughout this whole body of work that the actions, there's just a sense of remove compared to where how the figures are attached to the landscape themselves. And then, you know, we've you can clearly see it's, how, I'm how sorry. Big is this painting? Oh, thank how, you. How, how big is it? It's 60 by 60. And then you can see here, this figure here has, uh, he's holding a little teacup, almost placing it in one of those little holes. And then it's another painting. And you can see how things start to like break down in a way where, um, again, there's no horizon line. You're relying on reflections to kind of help place things. The action's a little bit nebulous. Got our tea drinker right here, leaning off on the boat. It's difficult to see like how close you are to land. Um, also, if you look at the reflections in the water, especially in the canoe, you see their reflection showing up for figures that are not there. Some mm -hmm. of the figures have no reflections. So again, I'm trying to create that sense of remove from the landscape. Um, here's the tarp painting we talked about a little earlier. And here we have an almost even more abstract, like foggy landscape where the figures are actually clay pigeon shooting. And then what they're actually shooting at are these uh, little teacups. And it's a very specific teacup. Um, um, actually, and here, this painting here is, the entirety of this painting was painted in a very matte way where it's like non-reflective, except for that large black cross-like shape in the center of the painting, which is like quite, quite reflective, which makes this a really difficult painting to photograph because the whole center of that painting is quite reflective. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got our tea drinker right there as well. Let's see. And then this was actually, uh, Natalie and I were talking earlier about like how I come up with some of these ideas. And then oftentimes I'm dealing with compositional ideas and then problem solving as I go through. And then um, one, I think I'd spent a month on one of these paintings. I just could not get it to work. And I took the whole canvas off the painting, flipped it around, gesso on it and said, you know what, I give up. I'm just going to start a whole new painting. And then I went home and I had a dream of this painting and I came in and just did this in one shot. So this just happened instantaneously. I just don't know where it came from. Um, but it was kind of like a little different than everything else I'd been doing at the time. It was like kind of a weird engagement with the landscape. But there's also this reflection of this tree coming down. So there's like a, a visual barrier as well that shows up for me. Um, here, you can see things are getting like a little more abstract as in the engagement with the landscape. And then we have our teacup here about to um, 
hit the floor, the reflective surface, and um, on and on. And then here's a really good rendering of the type of specific teacup. So it's um, it's a white and cobalt Staffordshire willow teacup. Um, it's very, very commonplace. I'm sure everyone's seen one of these at one point or another. Um, it's um, a teacup that has this range of Asian motifs built into it. And they're, um, where it came from, I found really, really interesting is that as Britain was importing um, fine china from all of these different Asian countries, um, then what happened is these British companies started making these knockoffs and they just mixed and matched all of these Asian motifs. So you have Korean mythology and Chinese stories and Japanese stories all mixed in to this one set of popular plateware. And then it ends up becoming so popular that it finds its way all the way back to China where the Chinese markets then start making knockoffs of the knockoffs. So I also thought that was like really, really fascinating. And um, it's also, I have a platter done in that style from the 1800s, which is my family heirloom, which is where like my ancestors were working as tenement workers on this estate. And then one of them was dating the maid. And as the people, the wealthy people who owned the house would throw this stuff out, she would bring it so they could use it in their two room little cottage where they worked. And I have this massive platter, which is welded together with lead. Um, so it's kind of like a funny little family heirloom. So, but I really thought that it was really interesting to think about this idea in regards to our engagement with the landscape, our engagement with each other, through globalizations, how everything's kind of like really stitched together in like interesting ways. Um, and then uh, this painting I find kind of amusing. It's, uh, I think of it as a sequel to the painting where the two guys are placing objects in the ice. And people would always ask me, what happens when the uh, ice melts? So this is what happens. And the little objects float to the surface. And then we have our tea drinker here as well. Um, and then the, and we're back to the beginning again. So I think that these ideas kind of really stuck with me out of this project and ideas of um, movements and place and um, immigration and um, economic factors and how those things all really influence uh, a lot of the world we live in. And I think it's a good segue into the work that I'm showing at the Higgins Gallery right now, which I completed over yeah, you, your newest installation, in fact, is up at the college right now. Yes, <laughs> so bear with me can. and I'll uh, I have a slideshow that's... Okay, and can everyone see this? Yes. All right. All right, so this is the body of work that I've worked on in the last couple of years, which is now up at the Higgins Gallery in uh, Cape Cod Community College. Um, so the first thing to notice about this, and I'll, I'll break down this whole project as I go through it, is um, I wanted to display this as a grid or a network. And I think of this not as a series of paintings, but as uh, one large piece made out of a group of paintings with a very, very drastic shift right in the middle. Um, and then Natalie uh, told you where I'm from and when I was born already. And uh, that's my website for anybody who wants to take a look at it. And then this is the artist statement or statement of practice I um, put together in regards to this work. Um, and I can read this out for you here. The work of Michael McMahon utilizes a variety of painting strains while subjecting them to personal systems. Presented as a large network diptych, the works here exist as a matrix, a 
codified mole from which the narrative release is born. They are linked using methods of communication reliant on corporeal transmission, pressed into existence, and delicately felt. Vibrational color studies of the 19th century shipping Morse code are overlaid on top of halftone images that reveal the artist's process involving hand-punched layers of large stencils, opposite are images of the landscape's natural boundary with the ocean overlaid with braille. If the pairing seems to create an abrupt transition, the body of work as a whole forms the aggregate to Mechthan's exploration, the movement, origin, and place. Now, if that seems like there's a lot going on there, um, let me break down this body of work for you. So it was really uh, important for me to hang this up in a way where it was really, really close together. So the pieces are kind of like reacting together. You're seeing it in a way where you're not stepping from one painting to another and you're in seeing it as a whole. Um, as a kind of a network or matrix. Um, now, I divide these up into, when I talk about them, the paintings on the left-hand side, the ones that are white, kind of like document-like, I call those the Morse code paintings. And then the work on the right-hand side, I call those the Braille paintings. So, um, the, let's see. And then here's a closer look up at the Morse code paintings. Um, so these paintings have a, are I'm really interested in like these ideas I brought up about the teacups, the ideas of like movement, origin, place, um, and like my own personal origins uh, are like really important in like describing this work. So I was really really interested in those ideas of how like economics can really affect um, movement of people, goods, uh, shipping. Um, and then I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what that's been like through different uh, time periods. So what we're looking at here, as I was like researching for this, I just went down this rabbit hole of these code books from the 1880s. And what you're looking at here are partial statements. So what happened was Morse code got incredibly expensive because it was the only way to communicate at the time. So the market was kind of cornered. They would charge you per letter. So this company came up with this idea where you could buy partial sentences. And you can buy partial sentences and you stitch them together with other partial sentences to get your message across at a more economical, um, a more economical way to communicate. And you can look at these, um, you can look at the list of stuff that were being like shipped at the time. Um, you know, everything here from dried turtle to uh, whiskey on this page. Um, if you look at the, lower the, the very end of this page, you can see how um, there's wax from all these different countries, whalebone, whale fins, wheat, whiskey. Um, and then some of the really interesting stuff though is when you start getting into these partial statements. Um, I really love this page. Um, you know, so looking at all of these, even though this was written in the 1880s, um, you know, you can take these statements out of context and I think apply them to our uh, current uh, political situations. If you look down there in the middle, there's all descriptions of issues going on with the captain. Um, you know, captain is insane, I think is a very uh, interesting way to talk about our current political issues. And then fast forward to, um, hundred years later, and I am born in the 1980s in Limerick in the southwest of Ireland. Um, so at the time, our economy was so bad that Ireland's economy was considered worse than third world. Immigration was just a natural fact of life. It wasn't really a, uh, it wasn't really so much of a choice or something to like think about in the future. Um, 
most people, once they get into their like late teens, early twenties in my family and community were immigrating. I have family, I think in every continent in the world, I've, uh, everything from, you know, New Zealand, all over Europe, um, United Arab Emirates, it just goes on and on. And um, there's, you know, it was just a very, very natural thing that eventually you would have to immigrate because of the economic situation there. Um, and then I was really interested in like just these ideas of like, it was the economy and the, and the, one of the reasons for the, um, economy being so bad is Ireland suffered like a massive fallout from decisions made in the United States by Ronald Reagan in regards to uh, oil prices having to do with like other issues in the Middle East which trickled down and like very very badly affected the area where I was from which was a very industrial region um, and then those economic factors can really Kind of like change the communities, the families you live in. It creates a situation where you're always waiting for the other shoe to drop in a way. So, and I found this article about somebody writing about the city in the 80s. And um, there's a wonderful line in here where uh, it says it was a madcap and comical and sometimes malevolent place. And uh, there was a tradition of antic tricksterism. Uh, um, and it, that really stood out to me. I just remember it always being like that, where it was just kind of constantly chaotic and um, people were really on like a, a hair trigger. So um, there was a lot, you saw a lot of violence, a lot of desperation, and there wasn't much that anybody could uh, really do about it at the time. Um, and here's more images of the city. And then since that time, you know, we went through the Celtic Tiger, the economy rose back up and collapsed again. Um, and then this is a very specific tale to my life, but at the same time, we're living in a time now where um, there's an unprecedented amount of people in the world desperately seeking a way to just survive and have no place to call home. And, uh, you know, I think, with everything going on with the coronavirus, things are just getting like worse and worse for, uh, you know, it's like we've heard nothing about anything besides the coronavirus in a month or so now, but uh, I imagine all of these uh, Syrian refugees and people trying to like make their way into Europe are suffering greatly or just not hearing about it. Um, so here is a close up of the, uh, the, uh, those Morse code paintings. And what I should explain what you're seeing here. So all of those little statements you were seeing, I would, I went through like the entire book of code, picking out like various uh, open-ended statements that I found interesting. And what I did was I would take the Morse code of that statement, and then I would put it down, and then I would repeat it over and over and over and over again, so that each one of these individual paintings took on its own particular pattern. And I, that was really uh, important for me to have a grouping of paintings that were in a way uniform, but each one of them was unique by the fact that what was happening is you were seeing information processed in a way that it was creating these like very, very subtle um, individual traits for each painting. So each painting takes on its own almost uh, verbal geometric pattern. And I was also really interested in this idea of Morse code relating to all of the little impetuses that I felt like made the decision for me to leave Ireland um, and immigrate to the United States. And in a way it's not, like a, it was no large push. It wasn't like a single moment, but a million small little nudges that I felt like just nudged me off the edge of Europe. And I thought it was like a really interesting way to show that the way that Morse code is created by like these small little nudges. 
And then if you'll notice too, underneath all of this Morse code, you're seeing this matrix of uh, color. And uh, what that is, is I, it is this painting, which I broke down into a halftone stencil. Um, and it is the painting Judith Sling Horachnes by Artemisia Gentileschi. And I've always found this to be a fascinating painting for numerous, numerous reasons. Um, it's just an incredibly well done painting, but the story behind it is um, the uh, woman cutting the head off of the warlord here um, was a uh, prostitute from the city that um, this guy was preparing to like overrun. And the reason he was doing that was because um, the king at the time said that uh, these particular cities didn't pay enough taxes in his war effort and he wanted them like, you know, uh, he wanted the cities sacked. And there's, you know, there's many, many ways to like look at this painting and, um, but one of the interesting things I thought too is that like when you look at this painting, it's very, very easy to forget the ideas of like the economic catalysts that drove the moment to come together for this painting. So what I did was I created a very elaborate stencil. Um, and I was also really interested in like trying to like do this in a way that like imbued the piece with like a, a real physicality. So I hand made this um, it, without the aid of computers. I just kind of like worked out a uh, value study and then broke it down. And then I used an antique leather punch to um, hammer through this thing for, it took me three weeks working all day, every day to just hammer through this thing to make a huge stencil. And um, Pretty sure my partner's listening in here somewhere and I'm still very, very apologetic for the noise and the amount of like little plastic discs that are still floating around the house years later now. Um, then and eventually I came up with this pattern and you can see it here in a uh, painting I was experimenting on it with. Um, and then I like to keep paintings around that I just constantly like work on and experiment with. So from like every few years, I'll have like a new idea and I'll just like throw it into like a group of these paintings that I've been saving up over time to just like let loose on. Um, and so what I ended up doing was, and I was really interested in like how memory affects our ideas as well in regards to these pieces. So I would arrange six canvases together, which fit perfectly on the stencil, which was uh, a 60 by 60 stencil. And then I would do a layer of color, and then I would rotate one painting off the end, bring it around to the front. So what happened was this um, momentary image would have some resemblance to the painting it's taken from, but it would start to get jumbled. So as you were looking at these like dot patterns, you're almost seeing something, but then it gets jumbled and pulled away from you. And so you start having a slight sense of remove from the image and it kind of uh, unsettles your, uh, your perception as you're looking at these. And then you end up with, um, images like this, which is what is underlying all of the Morse code. And then when I was making these, I also made a series of uh, drawings of these, um, which you can see here. And I just like to think of these as kind of like x-ray images of what these paintings would look like. Um, so you can actually see the Morse code laid on top of the matrix of dots that are interconnecting the no. So, so if you were to x-ray those paintings, I feel they would look very, very similar to this. And here's a good image where you can kind of see, looking at this, you're at a distance or if you squint at them, you can start seeing some of the underlying image start to come together, but you can never 
quite fully grasp it. And you can also see here to the um, way that the Morse code is actually forming its own distinct patterns, depending on like the length of the statement and so on in these pieces. What is really interesting is that the dots in the background, they look to me very much like water. So it's interesting to have a Morse code over, you know, mm -hmm. the water element. This is a close-up image of what that looks like. Here you can see uh, one of those paintings in isolation. And again, you can see the color coming through these um, reverse stencils that I created for these Morse code, which I uh, did each one of those little uh, dashes and dots by hand. And uh, so I want to make sure that like at a distance, it feels quite technical and mechanical, but as you get closer, it starts to um, become like almost gestural in a way. So let's see. Um, now, and then, uh, as they say in uh, Monty Python, uh, now for something completely different. So now I have an intentional shift in the images that are making up this whole um, body of work. And what you're looking at here is these landscape paintings I've done um, overlaid with Braille. And I wanted to transition the idea that came up in the Morse code paintings um, to find like new approaches of like how to get there. Um, and one of the ideas that kind of really stuck with me was um, ideas about how the body has a memory unique from the mind. And it's, like a, it's a phenomenon I've like personally experienced as somebody whose body adapted to a different landscape. Um, like I always, find myself feeling that like my body has like a sense of remove or it's like slightly out of sorts, like uh, in the United States. Um, and um, I found this like really interesting passage that uh, talks about like some of the way your body builds up its own particular memories. Um, and um, it was, uh, Funny, it's like, uh, I'm often reminded of this. Um, some of the few times I feel like in sync with myself as if like the weather is like wet and damp and misty. So, and so I was um, creating these landscapes where um, what I was doing was I had this idea of like being on the edge. So a lot of the landscapes are on the edge of water. Most of them take place on the east coast of the United States, um, where like the land meets the water. And then, but I was still having an issue with trying to like figure out um, how to create kind of a visual barrier. Um, so I didn't want them to just be landscape paintings. Um, my intention is never to just create a landscape painting, to use landscape painting itself as a tool and using you know landscape paintings very specific history as a tool to talk about um, some of the ideas I'm having in these paintings so it was um, so oftentimes what I'll do when I'm trying to like work out ideas and paintings is I'll uh, go for lots of walks and it's really nice having some dogs because uh, they kind of like force you to go for walks most of the time. And I was really trying to like struggle and come up with an idea to add something to these paintings. Um, and then what happened was that I got caught in the rain. And uh, if you've ever looked at your phone when there's some like raindrops on the screen and you start to see this like blue glow because it's almost like little magnifying glasses. And then and then that like sparked an idea in me where I was trying to figure out, I'm like, okay, I can kind of like maybe think about like a, uh, a screen of language or something like that to continue on some of the themes that were coming up in the earlier work. Um, but I really struggled with trying to like figure this out until I had this like aha moment. And as I was thinking about this ideas, like 
screens and barriers, I started thinking back to like one of my earliest strong memories. And um, I remember seeing the Berlin Wall come down on my little, uh, you know, 20 inch black and white TV in the kitchen in Ireland. And it was like, you know, I was like eight years old and it was the first time I had a realization of a world outside of like the world that had just become normalized and familiar to me. Um, and I was really trying to like, and it really like cemented for me this idea of like um, the types of barriers that exist in like different landscapes. They don't necessarily have to be walls in a way. Um, and that led me then to um, using Braille. I was like really interested in like, because I'd use the Morse code and there was a physicality of pressing the language into existence. And so I came up with this idea of like using Braille and whereas like the Morse code, there's this corporeal aspect of like pressing the Braille, the only way to like understand it is to actually feel it. So I felt that it was like really meeting or bringing the two sides of the project together where like one of them exists by like pressing and the other one exists by, by like feeling. So what I did was I came up with these series of writings that I wanted to like embed in those um, landscape paintings. And whereas what I had done with the Morse code paintings was I had created a pattern by repeating the same phrase over and over and over again. What I did with the landscapes was I had my own thoughts written down and I worked with them in like a cyclical way where the ideas would just like rotate and turn in on themselves over and over again as I was like trying to like work through particular ideas. And, but there would be like no resolution to those ideas and then I would translate those into braille and then paint them onto the images one dot at a time. It, it took about 21 hours for just to put the layer of braille on each one of these paintings. So this was a very um, heavy work intense uh, um, project that uh, um, had many, many different aspects that took a really, really long time. But I do really like working in that manner where I think it's really important as you're like working through um, painting that you have the time to do these processes where it becomes more of a meditative process where it's, um, it's like the idea of, you know, someone saying, I, uh, I write to understand what I think, I, I paint to understand what I think. What, what is the, the sentence on this painting? And maybe so, uh, the, these are personal, like writing, really these are personal writings that I don't reveal to anybody. Oh, I see. <laughs> and then you can see here. And then, so the goal was with these that I, um, at a distance, they actually start to look like they glow a little bit. So they're, they start acting almost like a screen in a way. So not only are you engaged with a uh, physical environmental barrier, but you're also then engaged with like a kind of a screen with this uh, language that you can't read. And uh, it also creates a slight visual barrier, which gives you a slight sense of remove from the landscape itself. But isn't it true that if you knew Morse code, you could decipher the text? So the, the Morse code, um, it's funny, I had a group of uh, these paintings up in a show and uh, the security guard had been in the Navy. And because it's old uh, writing from the 1880s, he just walked up to me at one point and he's like, you misspelled that word. Mm -hmm. And because uh, it was a, spelled with a O-U instead of an O, uh, O-S. Um, but um, these, I'm unsure if you could actually and you'd actually be surprised how many people just walk up and start touching these paintings without asking. So um, 
but the scale is a little different than typical Braille, so I'm not entirely sure that um, you could, but uh, who knows? And then uh, Braille, I don't think you could just read it by looking at it because it's very, very difficult uh, language to translate. Every symbol can be a letter, a word, or a phrase, and you almost have to uh, guess where the sentence is going oftentimes. So it uh, can be quite, quite difficult to engage with. And then all of those together when results in this. And then what I wanted to do was then place all of these together in a way where you, um, rather than it being like a static grid or network, I wanted like a sense of movement within there. And this is the display where it's displayed up at uh, Higgins Gallery right now. All right, and then leave that up there for now. Um, and then, so that is the end of the presentation. And then, um, do you want me to leave this up here or take it down and uh, I can open up for questions? Um, I think um, maybe, yeah, you can take it down so we can see people again. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Um, does anyone have a question for Michael? I have, a, I have a question. So it's really interesting that the first series of paintings have this kind of um, discordant, unsettling uh, tone where w one is kind of a little bit set off kilter. Mm -hmm. They're powerful people doing powerful things, but it's discordant. There's something out of, out of, out of sync. And then the latter set of paintings were using the Morse code and also um, Braille, there's this sense of um, weaving together different languages and kind of a combination. So they're almost, it's almost like, a, not quite, but flip sides of, of, uh, of each other, the, the, the two sensibilities. That's just occurred to me as I was watching this. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I agree with that to some degree. It's, I find that, um, um, I often find myself trying to engage with the world, especially living here now with a duality of experience. So, um, you know, it's, we're always growing, but it's, uh, your experience is like, um, the way I described those earlier paintings with the figures, um, there was like a sense of like remove with like their tasks and their experience and how they were like, examining their world and for me it was um, this kind of idea if you um, learn about the world through your uh, the generation before you and that information is like one generation removed from the world you live in but the values you're engaged with at that time were learned by a generation before that so you're actually engaging with the world with the values of two generations removed so there's always like a little bit of uh, disconnect so I think like it's the disconnect that I'm really interested in in like our engagement with the world so you you have a way Michael also to um, basically put a barrier uh, with your new work that you, you have shown me in your studio like for example when you use the grid do you, do you want to show a little bit of your newer newest works. Um, sure, is there any other questions about the work I just talked about before I do that? Well, John, I, you look like you're speaking, but what? your microphone's off. Oh. Yeah, that happens a lot these days. Um, I, I did join a little bit late, but can you can you just sort of indicate why the 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 interest in the tea and the tea cups? I don't, you may have already talked to that, but just briefly, I'd be interested to know. So I was interested in just ideas of globalism and um, interconnectedness of economies and the delicate unknown threads that kind of like stitch us all together. 
So the teacups I was really interested in because they are, they're everywhere. Um, you can't walk into an antique store without seeing stacks of them. They're probably in everyone's houses to some degree or another. I mean, I keep, uh, I found one stuck in the dirt in my garden one day. So um, the, the way they came about was from the import of all of these different um, bodies of China from our teacups and uh, plateware from China. Then the British company started making knockoffs and then they became so popular throughout the world that they made their way back to China where China started making knockoffs of the knockoffs. And that's why they're so prevalent everywhere. And I thought that was just like a really, really interesting way of looking at um, the influence of like a global market and trading of like goods uh, and movement of people throughout the world. And then, you know, the fact that it's a teacup and that really ties into like ideas of, um, you know, some of the foundations of like this country, which I now call my home. Like there's a very different relationship with tea in the United States compared to like tea in Ireland. Right. Do you, do you still have tea like five times a day? I certainly do. I was uh, drinking tea the entire time when I was giving that. That's what the long pauses were. That's great. <laughs> Anybody else? Yep. I wanted to, oh, hello. I wanted hello. to ask a question for my students. I'm teaching painting one for the first time at the community college this semester and they will all be seeing this video and I just want you to speak a little bit about your experience uh, at the college. Oh, okay. Um, funnily enough, I didn't take any art classes when I was at the college. Um, I ended That's up, fine. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I felt like uh, I immigrated to the United States the day I finished uh, high school. Uh, I had to think about it, we call it secondary school. Um, and I just had this like real, um, you know, I was out in the world by myself. I just took like a big leap and then I had applied to go to the Cape Cod Community College and I had no idea what I was doing. And I just felt I needed to figure out how to get a real job and a real career. And, and so, you know, did everything and anything besides figure that out. And the entire time I was like secretly painting away at home. And then eventually after I finished up my associate's degree, I realized the thing I'd been doing the entire time was painting. And that was the thing I was putting like all of my energy into all of the time. So eventually then I decided to go for that and then went to, UMass Dartmouth to um, um, do my bachelor's degree in fine art. But I will say that one of the catalysts, and I think it shows up a lot in the earlier body of work I did, was um, I always needed to be around creative people. So I hung out with the theater kids the entire time I was at uh, Four C's at, at Cape Cod Community College, for anybody who's not familiar with the Four C's is what us locals call it. <laughs> um, and it was really, really great to um, be in an environment where you could see creativity in interesting ways that I had never thought of. Because um, just watching um, the way they would put together uh, stages and settings was really influential to like my early work because um, at the time, my mindset had been, there's the thing, the role of the artist is to paint the thing or draw the thing as accurately as possible. And then I'd never thought of it as a, uh, the subject matter that I was working with as a tool rather than a subject. And that's really stuck with me. Seeing like somebody move a box around the stage, it was just like a, you know, a pedestal, like you put a sculpture on and one part of the play, it's a bar, the next it's a seat, then it's turned over on the side. And it basically like, stitches the whole production together and that really stuck with me and since that time I've always everything I do is never about the subject matter but how you can use different subject matters as tools and then 
So I think I'm like incredibly interested in landscape and in different aspects of that. I mean, it seems like such a like a thing that's always been around, but it was a very, very specific thing tied to uh, ideas of like Dutch nationalism that like brought landscape painting to the fore. And I think it's like important to like utilize those ideas and like um, talk about them like in the work. If that answers your question. It does, thank you very much. All right, anybody else? All right, so uh, Natalie, did you want me to do a tour of the studio? Yeah. It's okay, so don't mind. bear with me. All right, so, um, so I'm currently the artist in residence at the Umbrella uh, Art Center in Concord, Mass. This is my studio. It's um, a lot of, there's some work that's just wrapped up here that was meant to be going to a show before coronavirus um, kicked off. And then these are some of the pieces I'm working with right now where I'm in the landscape in a, a different way or I'm like mixing with some of these geometric patterns and um, trying to like work through my thoughts on what's going on with the work at the moment. But uh, I'm still working on some of those ideas, like a sense of remove. Um, and this is what I was currently working on today. And then I think the other thing too is like, what's really important for me in this work is I'm really invested in like a color theory. So these pieces here are like a ongoing body of work I've been working on where I'm just using a very minimal, simple palette of just orange, blue, and white and seeing how wide of a range I can get out of these. And eventually I wanna display these in a way that um, you're seeing like the full palette. Um, and then, so what I do is I, these are not, planned out at all. So I end up just creating these um, color grids in a way that um, allow me to um, play around with ideas of color theory and perception. I think the direction that this body of work's heading in is just um, ideas of perception in regards to the landscape and then also having some of these larger um, bodies of water showing up in some of these pieces. I can also show you some of the pieces that are not here at the moment. Um, there we go. Um, can everyone see this? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, and just these large bodies of water and, you know, the idea of um, control or loss of control in regards to the landscape. In, in regards to our, our, our own perceptions. So the size of those is at 30 by 30, 40 by 40? This one I think is uh, 42, I think by 42. Yeah, so this is like an ongoing project, but um, I'm a big proponent of just working and working and working through and like allowing the ideas to um, evolve in a more natural way than, um, like I definitely don't conceive of an idea and uh, make a bunch of paintings. Like, as I said before, I definitely paint in order to figure out and understand what it is I'm thinking. Uh, it's that like meditative process of just, you know, mixing color, value, and, uh, um, you know, the draftsmanship and just the, the process involved really give me that uh, space to take the time to work through the ideas. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome.
Arthur, là. Bon, thank you, Natalie. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you thank for Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.